I'd like to introduce you to everyone. Um, Lorraine Stanley is the CEO and founder of SWAD. And Lorraine, perhaps first of all, you can tell us what your organisation is and does. No bother at all. Yeah. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be part of the event. And SWAD stands for Sex with a Difference. And the difference refers to a lot of things. It's primarily about disability, but it also is to do with different uh, gender identities, different sexualities, different types of sex that you might be having. So I often say, you know, it's an assumption to think that we're all heterosexual, uh, monogamous people who have sex in the missionary position and that pretty much <laughs> lays it out and um, because there, there can be a perception in the mainstream media and stuff that disabled people can't or sometimes even actually shouldn't be having sex um, and so we're all about blowing that out of the water um, and facilitating different organizations to review what they're offering how they can actually get in touch with this it's it's a very significant health inequality and um, that's facing people with disabilities in the UK, not just in the UK, but that's what we're sort of focused on. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, something for everyone to reflect on is the fact that we can often um, have a bias towards um, providing services and information that fits the population at large and we often forget that people with disabilities or with different learning needs are still having sex. Um, how does that impact those, those people? What sort of issues do you see in the community itself? Uh, a lot of them I've experienced myself. So what set me off on this path to do with the sexual health side of things is I had an appointment at my own sexual health clinic um, had managed to sort of ditch the carers, get the kids sorted, got there there was a ramp which is brilliant and there was an intercom button but the intercom wasn't working um, and there was no other way of the door was too heavy for me to open um, and I ended up sort of kicking at the door and a member of the public in the waiting area came out and opened the door for me um, and it was such a simple thing but most people at that point you're often anybody can be a little bit maybe um, anxious about going and get a sexual health checkup so for some people they never would have got past that door um, and that's a part of the population that I know staff who are working in in the NHS really want to make sure everybody is getting the level of service and um, that they they should be getting it's a health issue and um, but it's just you know, for so many people, especially maybe if you have a learning disability, uh, if you're autistic, which I happen to be myself, where it's the unknown and just things that can be put in place before you even, you know, make the appointment, being able to find out where to make the appointment and knowing what to expect. Uh, so, you know, things like if there's patient information leaflets, then have you got a version of them that's available, more picture-based, it's called Easy Read. So it's simple things like that. Is there a photo of the reception area so that somebody who uh, maybe has anxiety issues uh, can know what to expect when they go in? And just the, the basics of maybe assuming that everybody can get on an examination couch. Um, that is not the case. If you're a wheelchair user, I have yet to become aware of a sexual health clinic or GP practice, which has got hoisting system for somebody to be able to get on that bench. So consequently, there's a proportion of people with disabilities and long-term health conditions where they just don't access those services, don't know how to get there, don't know who to talk to, don't know what to expect when they get there. And if you get past all that and you get into the room itself, your face would not be able to get on the couch. Um, but, you know, there is work to be done. There's some easy wins. There's slightly more, um, you know, needing a little more time, a little bit more money wins. Um, but there's simple things that, that you can do if you're working in that arena, the simple things that you can do to help. And are you able to describe for the delegates at the conference today, maybe some of the things that they could change in practice next week when they're back in either their clinic or in the organisation they work for, if it's a third sector or community based organisation that could have an impact overnight? 
<laughs> there are some really easy wins. Um, and my one of my top tips is start off with your website or ask a fem friend or family member who's not part of your, your hospital and NHS to see if they can find out on the website where the sexual health clinic is, is there information on ramps or, you know, um, sign language interpreters or whatever it may be? Um, are there photos of it? You know, what information is on there? I find a lot of, not just the NHS, widespread over all the sectors. Um, when you, they something say something about disability access in the, the bits at the bottom or in the tabs, often what they mean is whether it's... Um, internet approved protocols, yada, yada, configuration, all that sort of stuff. Whereas somebody like me, I just want to know where is in the hospital, how I get to it and whether I can get in. And um, so, and also from, if you, you know, that thing about walking a mile in somebody else's shoes thing, um, something else I like to do, you can't possibly understand the whole totality of what it's like to be a wheelchair user, but, what you can do is, especially if you're in your hospital, there will be wheelchairs. So go from the entrance of the hospital and experience what it's like to try and locate your clinic within that hospital. And think if you've got a lower visual impairment, if perhaps um, I get a lot of brain fog with stuff that's going on with me. So what have you got in place? If you've got somebody that's hearing impaired, that's pressing the intercom that you expect everybody to press, they're not going to be able to necessarily hear what you're saying. Something simple you can do with that is introduce, um, it's like press three times so that your reception staff know that whoever's on the other side of that line um, isn't going to be able to hear them. Um, so they actually come out to the door, things like that. Um, so that's one simple thing that you can do is just see what it's like. Sit on the disabled loo and see if you can reach the toilet roll holder. Um, and, and a wheelchair actually fit, you know, all wheelchairs are not equal. A uh, self-propelling wheelchair is generally smaller than a motorised one. So reach out to your local disability organisation. So say your MS centre, for example, Parkinson's, Independent Living Centre, ask them, you know, to, to come and give you some feedback. The best possible thing you can do is to hire a disability access consultant who is disabled to come in and, and do some work with you. But essentially, is there... A welcoming thing on your website so people can easily find out the information to get in touch with you. Can they get into you? Have you got leaflets that that cover, you know, not just um, regular people with, you know, uh, regular people that can read and interpret stuff very straightforwardly. If somebody has an additional need, that needs to be in there as well. Because talking about sex in the same way that in the mainstream, you will have people that say, oh, well, you know, if we tell our children about sex, they're going to be out doing it left, right and centre. There can be a related theme within um, people with intellectual disabilities where the professionals will assume that they're not a disabled people with whatever disability are not interested in sex, which is simply not true or not able to have it because they look different or their body shapes are different. Um, so it's about within your team, are you, have you actually considered this? Have people got experience of this maybe within their wider life with family or friends? Um, so reaching out to the disabled community and getting people in to help you to provide a better service. The attitude is actually one of the key things. It's if you're providing really good service to their whole population by default, then you will be giving good service to people from the, the disabled community. Yeah, that's really useful information. You touched on a couple of things there that are perhaps a bit longer term. Um, what are some things that you would like commissioners to think about or people who are designing new services to think about maybe over the longer term? <laughs> that's brilliant what i would like is that you have at least one room okay that has got a hoisting system in it now i know that there's a sh oh, you said a rude word there a ton of, <laughs> of 
committee meetings and I used to work within the NHS in, in a previous life. So I know the amount of planning and that goes into bit major works, for example. So if you're going to be re renovating an area, for goodness sake, make sure that the waiting area has got space for wheelchair users. OK, that's that's a simple one. But when it comes to the, some slightly bigger price tag stuff is make sure there's at least one room with a hoisting system in it. The ideal and the sort of fantasy one would be where it is completely integrated. Um, the next best thing is you can get ones that are freestanding, um, so you don't have to do any major work, so you would just construct it within the room and then that would work. Um, but at a basic level, having a mobile ho hoist um, there and staff having been trained on how to use it in the same way that you would be trained on moving and handling, things like that, um, that would be great. The other thing is leg supports. Not every examination coach has them. Comparatively speaking, they're they're reasonably affordable. And certainly if you have definitely one, but if you have at least 50% of your examination couches that have leg supports, that would be really appreciated. So that's for people, I have ME and fibromyalgia, so I have very poor muscle um, strength and holding positions. Um, people with MS, Parkinson's, if you have maybe cerebral palsy, there's a whole load of range of conditions that that would help and tell people that you've got them because it's it's amazing. Some of you guys have rethought really things out, but then you haven't actually told your audience what you've got. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really telling people and being you do some great work. I know that there are things like special sessions for, you know, younger teens and um, for people that are HIV positive, for people that are having, you know, men having sex with men. There's all these different sort of of groups of people um, and it inviting people into your service to have a look around, even if it's only you know, once a quarter, doing a shout out locally and saying, you know, when you're doing your newsletters, you know, you're welcome to come along. The quieter times are this. Uh, things like if you need slightly longer for your appointment time. Things like, you know, being able to move your body when your bits don't work very well takes time. If you've got somebody who uh, is autistic and just needs a little bit longer time to process and ask questions. If you've got somebody who uses an AAC device, like the one Stephen Hawking used to use, is they will need longer time. Um, and something which you may not be aware of, because it, it was quite shocking when I found out about it, is there's been some research and it turns out that sometimes where somebody has got a paid care plan, so they've got professional carers coming in to help them, PAs, some companies will not cover the um, fees for the time it would take for that person to go to the sexual health clinic because it's deemed to be not really an act of daily living, uh, which is the terminology. Um, That's really so shocking. It is shocking, yeah. I, I was gobsmacked um, when I found that out. Um, but you've got, in the wider context of, of care, when you've got uh, carers that are only been allocated 15 minutes to come in, and do the necessaries. I can appreciate that taking two hours out of a day to bring somebody to a health clinic, but if the person, you know, for example, had a, a breast cancer lump and needed investigations, would the care company, would the person who holds the health budget in the council, would they think it's reasonable to lo not let that person accompany the individual? They wouldn't, of course they wouldn't. They'd be like, of course, it's a health appointment. The biggest thing I face is, which I'm sure people who are here with you today, it's some of it is pure ignorance, not in a nasty way I'm saying that, just literally people don't know. Um, but some of it is people wanting to sort of hide themselves in the corner and go, that's just too difficult to think about. And I don't want to say anything because I might say the wrong thing. So they sort of pull the duvet up, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Um, so it's just normalising talking about stuff. Um, you know, I sit on the BASH public panel, British Association of Sexual Health HIV, um, and when I've had conversations around the table there and I've asked the question about has anybody actually seen a hoist, 
in any of the places they've worked? And the answer was no. Um, and that's what we're looking at. But it's it's sexual health, but it's also, you know, testing things. So, for example, uh, anything to do with the prostate, if perhaps you've got a spinal cord injury, how the heck? <laughs> <laughs> when when there are the self testing kits that you know are very yeah. useful to most people, that is a brilliant idea. But if you live on your own, because a lot of people are completely independent um, and they live in their own homes and they do their own thing, but you know, if you're not in a relationship, who do you ask to help that so- get that sort of swab? Yeah. Um, so yeah, feel free to. <laughs> to- <laughs> Tell me to button it for a second if I because I could talk about this for ages. Um, but yeah, the, there's just it's at, you guys deal with really sensitive subjects in a really fabulous way. Um, and I think if I could spread how your approach is to normalizing, you know, sex is just sex, it's another bodily function. And you know, we're aiming for a lot of pleasure. Um, but the reality of the day to day thing is so you you've already got a fantastic attitude for that, that if I could bottle it, I would spread that around all of the other sectors. Um, so this is just, don't, you know, don't beat yourself up if you've not been doing any of these things, because a lot of organisations haven't. But you guys have been really open about now that you've been alerted to the fact that there's this group of people that are not be, not reaching you at least you're open to listening about it you know and people have been doing things which is fab yeah and mm. um, British Sign Language as well if you've got stuff on your your website or you're doing any uh like media complaints like sexual health week and stuff like that is is you know hire a sign language interpreter so when you've got your videos that are on YouTube or whatever on your website make sure there's a signed version as well that's great um thanks Wayne we're running out of time now um just so that everyone um can get in contact with you um if they have any further questions or want any more information um what else are you what's coming up what are you working on and how can people reach you if they want to get in touch well the most straightforward way is all the w's swaddorset.org so that's s-w-a-d-d-o-r-s-e-t.org um, and we've got all the social stuff on there. And um, what we're working on at the moment, it's going to be published very soon as I'm working on an ebook, um, actually about what we're talking about here, which is improving accessibility to sexual health clinics. Um, so keep an eye out for that because we'll be promoting that um, on our socials. Um, so that will be really good. And that's really exciting because I've wanted to write a book about this for a long time. Um, and yeah, the other thing just to mention, uh, I have sent some of these up to head office. So they will be in a pile somewhere there. Um, is the let me read that sex intimacy card. It might be appearing backwards on your screen. Apologies for that. Um, but basically, it's something you can hand to your doctor or whoever and it just flags up to them that you want some help in talking about this matter um but you guys are completely unembarrassed by talking about this stuff so but that's just for generally handing out and um, that's there as well but yeah all the w's swaddorset.org and thank you for having me that's okay thanks for your time Lorraine okay bye <laughs>